to some. And I find now that, you know, watching events as I grow older is a bit like reading a great novel, like Tolstoy, perhaps, War and Peace. It's like sitting up late at night and, you know, you're reading the book and you look at the clock and you think, it's almost midnight, I'll just finish the chapter. And then you go on and reading, and in one more chapter. And before you know it, there's dawn between the curtains. You know, it's dawn. You've read all through the night. Because you want to know what happens next. And that, I think, is why I've stayed on in the Middle East. I am um, caught by this historical future, what happens next, because it will be worse. I, I'm a great pessimist, I'm afraid, about the Middle East. And um, when you even use the word peace process, as you did <laughs> before the break, I sort of shuddered like this. Um, there isn't a peace process. There is absolutely no peace process. Blair is useless. Obama is not going to bring peace to the Middle East. Uh, this is an illusion. These whole peace talks, so-called peace talks in Washington are to try and help Obama in the midterm elections. They have nothing to do with the Middle, peace, Middle East peace. What on earth was the result? Oh, we're going to meet again in two weeks' time or one month's time. Oh, great. Fantastic. You know, Israel has no intention, I believe, of allowing a Palestinian state to come into existence. I fear there will be a one-state solution. It'll be called Israel, in which the Palestinians will be the guest workers to go on building more and more houses. Uh, area C of the West Bank, which is the area totally under Israeli occupation still, under the Oslo Agreement, of course. Area C is 60% of the 22% of Palestine that is left. When Mahmoud Abbas is actually arguing for a state, he's now arguing for a state, assuming that Area C has gone to the Israelis anyway. I mean, a Palestinian can't even put an electricity pylon in the ground. He can't dig more than three inches there. He can't build a, an extra a floor on his house in that region. Given the fact that Area C is basically gone, in fact, Abbas is negotiating now for a Palestinian state in what would be, in my calculation, about 10.9% yeah, yeah. of mandate Palestine. It won't work. And it's quite clear from the humiliating way in which the Israelis have treated Obama and the humiliating way in which Obama has responded to these pressures that, in fact, the Americans are not going to have a just peace in the Middle East. And what this is all about, of course, is not about democracy or human rights, although I know Arabs would like democracy and, and some packages of human rights off our supermarket shelves. <laughs> this is about justice, and it is about injustice, and we are not going to help you about injustice. You are going to be treated unjustly, you, the Arabs, by us, the West. Uh, and we have no interest in righting these wrongs. Uh, we'll give you lots of amorphous ideas. We'll come and bring you democracy. Usually we'll arrive with our horses and our M1, A1 tanks and our Apache helicopters and our swords. Uh, that's always the way we arrive to save you from your oppressors, of course. Um, but yeah. we're not going to um, deal with injustice, and, and therefore there is no peace process, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but no, you don't have to be sorry at all. I, I know. I be, but, but what happens next? I mean, if there's no hope whatsoever. I mean, you have such a grip on the, on the, on the picture in the Middle East. But Look, your uh, words I, I, just... I think first... Go ahead. I think, first of all, you've got to identify the problems, not issues, I hate that word in English, the problems, mashekel, the problems that need to be resolved so that you can actually move towards peace rather than more war. At the moment, I fear very much there will next year perhaps be another war between the Israelis and the Hezbollah. I'm very concerned about that, not least because I'll be there. No. Um, you know, I don't want a war any more than the Arabs do, or the Israelis for that matter. Um, but, you know, the real issue is this. As long as the world's only superpower, well, the only largest military power at least, gives totally uncritical support without any conditions, unconditional support for Israel, right or wrong, mm. in billions of dollars, economy, socially, um, politically, militarily, of course, mm. there will be no solution because as long as Israel can, in effect, be part of a superpower, it can never have a peace, and nor can the Arabs. Mm. And there will not be a Palestinian state. Uh, this phrase, a viable Palestinian state, but a secure Israel. There should be viable and secure Palestine and Israel. Uh, but I don't think there'll be a Palestine. That's why I still put it in quotation marks in my articles. Um, when it does become a state, I'll take the quotation marks off. Yeah. Um, but you see... Yeah by constantly talking about, oh, we want to bring democracy to the Middle East, we want fairness, all oh, the poor Palestinians, oh, they have all these checkpoints. Well, that's great, but if you don't do anything about it, it's not going to get better. 
And one of the reasons I'm against these endless peace process talks and this thing, I mean, what has Blair ever done as an envoy in Jerusalem? Nothing. Mm. Is that we constantly feed false hope and false hope will lead to war and instability. Mm. We've got to face the real issues, which one obvious one, for example, is that the US as a political entity, its foreign policy is driven by Israel, not the other way around. I'm sorry to say. Right, right. Um, but, and uh, yet... The Arabs don't have a lobby, <laughs> forgive me, in the United States. The Arab lobby, such as it is, is pathetic, truly pathetic. Right. And the Israel, Israel supporters, let's face it, they work very hard for their domination of political narrative in the United States. And yet you say in one of your articles uh, that the real earthquake beneath Israel is a nation called Israel. Look, uh, that was an article I wrote after attending the Herzliya conference in Israel. I mean, I go to Israel often, um, where I found that the right wing, it, it, it's a conference for right wing Israelis. I mean, um, um, Zippy Livni was there, Netanyahu was there, I saw them. Uh, the deputy chief of staff of the Israeli military, um, Benny Katz, was there. And I found that what they were talking about was a kind of self-delusion. I'll give you a typical example, because you know, we don't have enough time to go into mm. this in great detail, but they're now referring to, will there be a third Lebanon war? Now, there's a problem that you've probably already spotted with this. There have actually already been a war in 1978, a war in 82, a war in 93, a war in 1996, and a war in 2006. I covered all of them in person. Yes, yes. But they've deleted some of those. Well, they deleted 78, 93, and 96. Yes. And they're now saying, oh, will there be a third Lebanon war? They mean, will there be a sixth Lebanon war? So even because those wars were so painful and because effectively, well, Israel didn't win them. I don't know if they lost. They certainly didn't win. Israel's army, remember, hasn't won a war for 37 years. Yes. I mean, every other military adventure they've gone on has been a disaster. Bob, Let's you not mentioned all the Arab disasters. This is, by the way. This is such but a statement. No, let me just finish. The point is right. that if you're going to bend the narrative history of your own country's involvement in the Middle East, then you cannot reach serious conclusions about the road to peace. Right. So right. it is this self-delusion. That's why I said Israel is its right. enemy. There is Israel's enemy. Yeah. I mean, of course, there are some indications to it that when someone. Uh, of the caliber of uh, Robert Fisk um, states now that there is going to be a war next year. Uh, I didn't. I said I feared there would be a war next year. I didn't right. say there was going to be. Oh, okay. You fear that there will be a, a, a war. Uh, I want to avoid the headline in a, in a Lebanese newspaper. <laughs> Fisk says war in 2011. I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm saying I fear it. What makes you fear it? Well, firstly, because the Lebanese fear it, and secondly, because when I was in Israel last, which was about three months ago, a lot of Israelis were telling me they thought next year there would be a war with Hezbollah. And when you have two sides who both think there's going to be a war, there very often is, I'm sorry to say. But if you go beyond that, you see the Israeli army is still wanting to show it is powerful, strong, able to crush Arab armies or Arab militias. Mm. It still feels it was humiliated by Hezbollah in 2006. It was. The Israelis are right about that. It was humiliated. And so they want to get back on top. Uh, it won't work because Hezbollah's security is so extreme, in other words, efficient. And its military operations are so efficient, unfortunately, for the Israelis. And they are building but, roads uh, near the borders. Yes, indeed. What are these roads for? Well, to move on later on. I mean, but remember, there's a, a whole uh, different perspective to this. If there is another um, Israeli Hezbollah war, there are going to be NATO military brigades in the more robust UNIFIL that was brought in after 2006 that are going to be caught underneath all this bombing and shell fire. That's going to be a very serious matter for Europe. You know, you've got armoured units in there of the French, the Belgians, the Spanish, the Germans. This is not just the old UNIFIL of nice, friendly third world soldiers uh, and, and a few small European countries like, you know, uh, Finland or Ireland. This is now a major NATO army with three ma NATO generals in southern Lebanon. So mm -hmm. if there is going to be another war, it's going to be a major crisis for Europe and therefore by extension for America as well. But again, I'm not saying there will be a war, but I fear it because both the Israelis and the Hezbollah talk about it. They've got new weapons they want to test. The Iranians, remember, uh, wanted to see how their ground-to-ground -ground missiles worked in 2006. That was the missile that hit the Israeli right. Hetz-class gunboat off Beirut right. and almost sank it. It burned for 25 hours.
Right. What did you make, uh, by the way, of uh, uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah's revelation uh, recently uh, of uh, some of Israel's activities in the lead up to the assassination of uh, uh, Prime Minister Rafiq al Hariri? Well, let's put revelations in quotation marks. I read that speech very carefully. I didn't watch it live. Um, <coughs> you know, a long time ago, I came to the conclusion that the UN tribunal, <coughs> excuse me, that the UN tribunal into Hariri's assassination would never reach a conclusion. I mean, it's already more than five years since Hariri, Rafi Hariri, ex-Prime Minister of Lebanon, was assassinated, February 14, 2005. Mm. This must be the longest murder inquiry in the history of the world. Mm. And in this time, of course, the politics and the history of the Middle East has rolled over. Syria, which was supposed to be part of the axis of evil, you know, Iran, North Korea, has suddenly come up again. You know, Bashar al-Assad is invited to Bastille Day, American diplomats are back visiting him in Damascus. It's no longer politically convenient to say, well, the Syrians killed Hariri. And as, the, as part of this turn of the football, if you like, has gone over, it's not a football match, but it feels like it sometimes in a very bloody way, at the same time, um, has come uh, a new element. Oh, it was the Hezbollah behind the assassination. In some way, the Hezbollah had been brought in. I don't think Hezbollah did kill Hariri. I think they're much too smart to get involved in such a, um, a vile and identifiable murder as that. But what we also know, you see, is that with the large number of arrests in Lebanon of alleged Israeli spies, who are, of course, in fact, Lebanese, uh, and that some of them are involved in the communication system. We then also have to remember, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, much of the evidence which pointed to Syria at the time of Hariri's murder was uh, taken from evidence of mobile phone calls, mm. originally hoovered up by British, um, uh, uh, the British Satellite Communication Centre in Cyprus and then handed to the UN Tribunal to examine. Um, and now, of course, what Hezbollah is trying to say is, well, all these communications were compromised by the fact that the Lebanese mobile system, the company that ran them, or one of the companies, Alpha, had within it people who were operating as Israeli agents. That's what all this is about. But basically, everyone is busy washing their hands. Mm. And in the end, what the Lebanese will conclude is that Lebanon killed Hariri. Mm. Uh, very nice, soft, someone, people within Lebanon. But I remember when President Mouawad was killed, I got to the scene within seconds. Immediately along comes his security team. And I asked this guy, a friend of mine, I said, Mohammed, who killed him? He said, Lebanon killed him. <laughs> and now you go back, so did yeah. the Syrians, did the Iranians, would the Hezbollah have had any reason? He had a lot of business uh, rivals at that time, you see, and on it goes. Uh, and then, of course, the, the version that came from the sort of intelligent side of the Iranians was, well, oh, he was having business deals with uh, Alawi, or he met Alawi that morning, an arms deal had fallen through. And, you know, with a man of, of such connections as Rafi Kariri, you can just about imagine anyone could be an enemy. And that, of course, is what those who killed him want us all to believe. But somebody did kill him. That was a real bomb. Mm. And all you can say, I'm sorry to say, is that there hasn't been a political assassination in Lebanon that has ever been solved since the foundation of the state in 1946. Mm. And no one has ever been arrested and brought to justice for any political right. assassination right. in uh, Lebanon, ever. And it's not going to happen either. Right. Uh, Bob, you've, uh, one of the... Um, I, I, I have to confess, I, 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 I like the way you uh, conduct um, uh, yourself, um, uh, uh, covering um, various stories uh, uh, related to the Middle East or otherwise. Um, I'm, 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 but, I, but I'm particularly fascinated by your writings on how the media uh, work. And I would like to... Or don't work. Or don't or work. Don't work. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. Uh,